everyone. Thank you for joining today's Resilient Connecticut webinar to hear climate vulnerability mapping for municipalities. I'm Joanna Wozniak-Brown, Circa's Resilience Planner, and I'll be moderating this hour-long webinar, which is part of a series that Circa is hosting along with partners on a variety of adaptation and resilience topics relevant to our state. Before we start, I just want to mention a few webinar mechanics. This webinar is being recorded and we'll post the recording online following the event. And everybody has their audio muted except for the presenters, but you can use the chat box in the bottom portion of your screen to ask questions. If your chat box is not open, then you can click on the chat icon that looks like a conversation bubble in the lower middle part of your screen and simply type in your question and click enter so I can see it as the webinar moderator. We'll try to save the last 10 minutes for questions and answers, and I'll do my best to track your questions and facilitate responses with our speakers. So today we are fortunate to have two presenters, including Yaprak Onet, who is Circa's Assistant Director of Research, Alex Felsen, who's Circa's Deputy Director, and Peter Minuti, who's Associate Professor in UConn's Plant Science and Landscape Architecture Department. So before we get started, just a reminder to enter your questions via the chat function. So now we'll begin by turning it over to Dr. Onet. some issues in your municipality or maybe you are overwhelmed with the information that you have or maybe you have underwhelmed with the information that you have but you wanted to start and do something and maybe catch up what Circa is doing and that's why we wanted to start this uh, climate vulnerability mapping for municipalities webinar. So before we um, start talking about the vulnerability, um, I would like to show you this lovely picture from West Haven to uh, see like what we are talking about when we decide the vulnerability. This is a very nice picture that shows us how the complexity of a coastal system is. So it has a coastal defense, coastal groin here to protect the erosion and the shoreline. There is the roads, infrastructure, river is coming. It's a seabird sanctuary here and estuaries over there. There's a wastewater treatment center. And there's just like lovely houses over in the shore. So before this coastal development, this community uh, can develop any kind of adaptation strategies, they must identify where they are most vulnerable. And uh, with limited resources and poor access to hazard information, uh, communities may perform ineffective assessments, basing their adaptation efforts more of a perceived rather than the actual vulnerability. So therefore, there is a need for a science-based measurement tool to evaluate vulnerability at multiple scales and inform a decision framework to support prioritization of the assets uh, that needs to increase the resiliency and integrate projects in optimum adaptation policies. And that's why we decided to go with vulnerability assessment, because it's a comprehensive process and involves uh, hazard identification and analysis and determine the result of vulnerabilities on critical infrastructure, society, economic resources, and the environment. Um, so basically, we need to know where we are before we decide on where we are going. And the where we are going is, in this case, is the resiliency. Um, so the community's resiliency depends on the performance of a natural and built environment and support the social and economic aspects. This can be either done individually or collectively, but it is essential for immediate response and long-term recovery for a community to follow a damaging hazard event. In this case, uh, we wanted to provide a comprehensive and also sector-specific vulnerability to sea level rise uh, so the users can identify the key contributing factors to the climate change and apply their assessment results. So when we mention about the multi-scale um, advantage, you can decide on in which part that you would like to look and probably you're interested in the municipal right now and um, in different components that different contributor factors affecting that vulnerability and if you're just interested in the one as aspect then you can also look at look into that vulnerability and that's what we call the sector specific um, so we use coastal vulnerability index model to combine multi criteria decision analysis techniques and special analysis Coastal Vulnerability Index enables understanding into complexities of the coastal system, like the picture I showed in the beginning of this webinar. And um, that allows us to identify more vulnerable places that could support decision policies. So in order to characterize the contributing factors or the input variables, we did an intensive data collection system and categorize all these um, 
layers that we found online uh, based on the GIS. And we normalized them and manipulated them and aggregate them by the means of their response to the sea level rise and obtained our vulnerabilities for uh, specific purposes. So the contributing factors or the input variables that I'm talking about are divided into four categories. Um, and this is the list that what you have seen. We have almost like 30 layers, CRTGRS layers, that we uh, rank their responses with respect to sea level rise and obtained information. So the rest of the presentation, I would like to talk about uh, the theory a little bit, but also to show the application in the town example. So let's talk about the contributing factors. What we have here is that what you see is the elevation distribution, what we obtained from LIDAR one meter resolution. What you see on the right hand side, it's going from very uh, low to very uh, high scale, so green to red. And we see this is the distribution for the all coast, uh, coastal towns in Connecticut. And when we look at the average, the black arrow shows that it's in the moderate vulnerability when we just like take the average of all the elevation in this layer. What you see over on the uh, left side is the acreage because we have a one acre resolution. Every little one acre squares or grids combined to give this analysis. So you can look at it in an all state and that's what I meant by the multi scale, but you can also focus in this case in New Haven, uh, how the elevation is distributed among all these grids or one acre uh, squares. And then you, what you see is like very highly red. Um, the purple arrow, I have a lot of colors here, but if you can see the purple arrow, that shows that it's in the high vulnerability range. So we understand that New Haven has a higher um, elevation, which is a contributing factor to sea level rise, because if you are in a low elevation, we understand that you are more vulnerable to sea level rise. And then you can see just the New Haven distribution on this uh, graph, like where it is actually showing in the overall the average and the, its contributing statistics. Another example is impervious area. So this is on the left that you see for the coastlines, uh, coastal towns for uh, impervious area, and the average of the impervious area is actually in a low range, uh, but when we look at the New Haven, you can see in which points, uh, it's probably very highly um, populated areas, its structures, so that the imperviousness is very high, and you can see that the where the average of the New Haven town and where it corresponds to in the um, general old analysis of the coastal towns. So this can give you an understanding if you're looking from, um, from a bird view where you wanted to start or move forward in your project or just to justify that what is contributing that the vulnerability of the sea level will rise in that area. So that we have a, actually almost like a, uh, almost over the 30 layers. I'm not going to go over specifically, but I would like to go over the sector specific vulnerabilities I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar. So these are the six categories, yeah, six categories that you can see that. And we are looking at the combination of these 30 input layers in different combinations with respect to sea level rise. So, so just to give you an example, if you're looking for the climate vulnerability, we consider sea level rise, storm surge, wave power, uh, mean high, high water level of tide, and the wind speed. So the combination of all these layers will give a distribution on the right-hand side that you can see for the New Haven. So you can understand where the climate vulnerability is very high. Or salt water intrusion, in this case, these are the layers that we see that and how it is contributing. So you can understand that what would be uh, the risk zone for any kind of a groundwater contamination due to sea level rise. Another example is the erosion vulnerability. What I want you to focus on here that we always use sea level rise because sea level rise is our climate stressor here. But since we created all these layers, um, you can use, if you wanted to look for the storm surge um, contribution to the erosion vulnerability, you can replace the sea level rise with the storm surge layer and obtain your erosion vulnerability with respect to storm surge instead of the sea level rise in this picture that you can see it. And we have social habitat and general coastal vulnerability. It is going similar, but I would like to focus mostly on the coastal vulnerability because this actually incorporates all the layers that we are using. Um, so let's move on to the coastal vulnerability. When we look at the general picture, 
uh, we have the statistics for each contributing factor. So the general coastal vulnerability of the New Haven, we understand that it's almost 20% higher uh, than the overall if we look at all the coastal towns in Connecticut. And if you just look for the um, center of government, uh, uh, South Central, it is 23% higher in overall. And this is the general coastal vulnerability distribution. So let's dig into the picture now. So I see here one is a red zone area, two, three, four, and five red zone areas. And I'm trying to understand what it means because we understand, okay, um, so red is where we need to put our attention first, but there are a lot of red zones are going on here. Which one I need to put attention? So in order to understand that, you need to see like what is going on, what's contributing to that vulnerability with respect to sea level rise in that area. So this part, Fairhaven and Quinnipiac River uh, comes around. So these red zones are actually along that uh, water uh, river area. So we know that for all the, in general, for the New Haven, elevation is like the low elevation is a very big contributing factor. But just because that is um, the wave impacts are coming inside, the wave impacts are also important. And salt water limit, low salt water limit is also a contributing factor to sea level rise vulnerability here. Uh, when we look at the Westville area, we see that um, surface materials, uh, the type of the surface material cause erosion due to sea level rise, and we have elevation like always, and it is more populated area, so there are lots of buildings and low elevated uh, streets. This area around the Yale campus, uh, we have again the elevation, but since there are lots of buildings, there are lots of impervious areas. So imperviousness is the main contributor here, in addition to the streets and uh, buildings that's causing susceptible to um, vulnerability with respect to erosion and sea level rise. This area behind the Long Wharf, um, the model actually finds that the Amtrak route over there and the imperviousness. So this kind of gives you an overlook of like where, uh, what is causing more uh, the information and the vulnerability in that area. And around the Morris Coal, um, yes, we have the elevation, we have the surface material that's causing erosion or high tide. Uh, but another thing that model shows us that there is a very low rate of the health insurance here. Uh, so the social vulnerability is putting a contributing factor. And the disabled population is high over there. And there is also an airport here. So critical infrastructure is there. So that's why it is going to be a vulnerable, more vulnerable. So depending on your funding or your interest, if you would like to do a transportation project, you'll know where to start. Or if you wanted to prioritize your social areas with disabled populations, you know where to start. So this kind of advantage that vulnerability uh, model gives that to you. So what we are trying to say that this, our coastal vulnerability model and um, zones of shared risk mapping that um, Professor Felsen and Professor Minnesi is going to mention that in a bit, uh, we are hoping to give you a priority zone for planning. This is very advantageous if you're also looking for not just your individual town, but also cross-jurisdictional problems. Like, for example, if you would like to do a project with West Haven and New Haven, that they can look at it in a bigger scale and understand the contributing factors that's affecting their vulnerability and uh, propose or convince their stakeholders according to that. I'm going to go back to the coastal vulnerability aspect again. We have a viewer, um, and it's going to be available soon. And you can, with that viewer, you'll be able to look at it in different assessment types. Um, so you can choose your area of interest, depending on just looking your town or your cog or the old town and then choose like which individual layer or contributing layer that you would like to look or sector specific or in general coastal vulnerability. And with this viewer, what you see here is like um, the soil susceptibility to the erosion layer, for example. You'll be able to see it in multi scale. You'll be able to see a map distribution. You'll see the statistical distribution like I showed you before. You'll be able to download these layers, analyze or combine layers. Uh, you'll have a base map that you can change the base map however you want it, or the color scale, transparency, or you can overlay with the flood scenarios. Another project that we are also continuing that we provide towns the 
um, how the community lifelines defined by the FEMA uh, can be affected by different flood scenarios. These community lifelines are the critical businesses and government functions that's essential for human health and economic security. These are all the lists and we have as even more uh, than that. So we can overlay um, what different flood scenarios around it. In this case, New Haven is a very populated area, so there are a lot of lifelines. So I, I didn't want to overwhelm uh, you with every little icon here, but I just wanted to put like what is mostly affected here. So you'll be able to see that with 100 year flood or with 20 each sea level rise that which we are planning for in 2015, uh, which um, and lifelines are being affected, and the numbers right next to them shows that how many lifelines are actually affected by those flood scenarios. So you have that. Um, this, the blue line, blue bar shows that 100 year flood scenario, and the uh, orange one shows the 100 year plus the 20 inch sea level, right? So the prepared for the 2050. You'll be able to see that which ones are affected. For example, you can think about that oh, this food bank place is no matter what the scenario is, and then I put here an extreme scenario also, 100 year and 70, um, just to see that this food bank is very affected no matter what, or fire station is affected no matter what, or this hospital is affected no matter what. So you would like to maybe prioritize these, saving these uh, features first. Or you can also consider that, hmm, for the gas station, um, for the sea level rise without the sea level rise, it is affected the same. So we would like to maybe save this and then um, not put our money for the extreme flood uh, scenarios yet. Uh, so you can contribute that kind of uh, uh, decision making or which child centers are affected, where can we do that. So um, in general, collectively or individually, you can put your resources in. So what we are hoping to uh, provide the municipalities is a building a community and hazard profile. So they can ask the questions that's given on the screen right now uh, to identify where you would like to start, where you want to put your resources in, or how you want to um, communicate this information, and how you want to customize this information, which we are very happy to help you to do that too. So in general, at CERCA, we are planning to do a general coastal uh, and climate vulnerability assessment. So it will not just look the coastal aspect that I mentioned to you, but we'll uh, talk about the heat, biodiversity, health, infrastructure, and water. And we are hoping to combine all of these so that it can help you to whichever the perspective that you're looking for, that you'll have a vulnerability assessment so you'll know where to start, what is the general picture of your area. So the expected timeline of these products are uh, coming very, very soon. Uh, but the general climate vulnerability assessment is going to be in phase two of our uh, project of the Resilient Connecticut. So it's going to have a little bit of time to complete. But you'll have time to um, just play with it. Our vulnerability viewer very soon and have a report and published material uh, by summer for all these um, vulnerability indicators and aspects for your towns and your forests for uh, the York Cubs and in general for the all co uh, Connecticut coastlines. Now um, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Felton if he's here. <laughs> and I can have the question. How are now. you? Hi. Hey. All right, so I'm the presenter now. I just want to make sure, let's see. Uh, putting on my screen and... Um, this presentation up. Okay, so can you see my screen? Not yet. The slide that should say vulnerability typologies? No, not yet, Alex. Okay, hold on. Let me just see if I need to share. Um, okay. There we go. It's now it's starting to share. Excellent. Do you see um, vulnerability typologies? Uh, not yet. It still says they're starting to share content. Oh, nope. There we go. Great. If you can just expand it. Oops, it should be full screen now. Might be a little bit of a delay. There we go. Great. Okay. 
Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining the call today and thank you Yaprock for, um, for preparing and for sharing uh, the value of the vulnerability assessment that you've been working on. A lot of work has gone into organizing data and information in an effective way overlay this and to use the this as a tool as an ongoing tool so uh for us i think the the vulnerability assessment really goes hand in hand with the planning process i think it's interesting when you start uh, the vulnerability assessment uh to look at specific areas and looking in and different weighted uh analyses to tease out and start to understand better what some of the risks are and opportunities in a, in a given area uh, and just taking a step back, what we're ultimately trying to look at is what's the what kind what, what's the implications of flooding? What what are the implications of sea level rise? What are the uh, the the considerations of other climate uh, change scenarios such as uh, heat? And how does that impact uh, uh, urban? How does that impact ar areas of development and um, inhabitants? As as well as over time, the overlay of the developments in, in urban systems with the ecological systems that are tied to uh, Long Island Sound. I think that's one of the interesting or the complex challenges of planning is recognizing the, the housing, roads, infrastructure, public amenities, and ecosystems and how these all uh, overlap. And in Connecticut in particular, where you have uh, a mixture of high ground and uh, low-lying coastal deltas, there's a, uh, the, the conditions along the coast and the flood risks are heterogeneous. So there's, you know, winners and losers, there's pockets of uh, risk and there's conflicts across stakeholders, for example, between pri private property owners and more of a collective uh, perspective or a municipal good. So this all raises the importance and the need for more creative and innovative approaches, particularly not just in terms of physical planning, but in terms of communication and coordination across uh, subpopulations that share similar risks. And so the, the concept of the zones of shared risk that, that is one of the planning tools that we're using as a group at Circa, it, it, it essentially is like thinking about the way that ecologists approach ecosystems. So, you know, there's, there's a hierarchy of ecosystems and it really depends on how you define them. Uh, you can look at the ecosystem of a of a patch of forest, or you can look at the ecosystem of a you know the relationship of let's say fleas on the back of a dog, uh, to get to a really small scale. And the idea of stretching across scales is a critical uh, value for thinking about planning and adaptation. And so we're looking at Long Island Sound, and we're zooming into local uh, areas, and we're thinking about uh, neighborhoods and populations. And, and starting to recognize how and where we can develop uh, an understanding of resiliency opportunities in specific areas, defining subpopulations that share similar risks that we can target uh, from a, the perspective of planning, but also from the establishing, for example, innovative financial models, uh, public strategies, uh, targeting specific communication to shared populations that have similar risks. Thinking and thinking about um, about strategic investment options for those subpopulations. So here is an example in Madison for um, along Circle Beach Road and Neck Road, and you can see that Circle Beach is kind of an extension um, past Neck Road. And so when you look at a digital elevation model, these are um, available on the uh, Connecticut um, CT Eco and, and uh, the Magic site um, from Yukon. You can start to see that there's a differentiation in the topography between Neck Road and Circle Beach. Um, and just as a simple analysis, essentially Circle Beach could be defined as its own zone of shared risk. It's an isolated housing area with one egress route. Uh, it's, this, is a, this is a coastal beach development. It has a large marsh complex behind it. So you have flooding from the back, flooding from in front. Uh, and then the Neck Road area functions as, as its own zone or set of zones. And essentially Circle Beach is reliant on Neck Road, but Neck Road is not reliant on Circle Beach. That's how you start to differentiate uh, subpopulations that share similar risks. And you start to think about how to make decisions or how to organize uh, groups of discussions. So for example, you might have a group from Circle Beach working on adaptation solutions for their area, but you may not lump in folks from Neck Road for that purpose. 
On the other hand, if you're thinking about Neck Road, you probably would want to include Circle Beach um, uh, homeowners in order to think about sort of the extension of that uh, egress route. Um, another more urban example is in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. Here's the uh, FEMA DFERM map looking at the Pequannock River along the downtown area of Bridgeport. And if you look along the western shore, the, uh, along um, Stratford Avenue, you can see the bridge there. That's a that's a low point in the downtown area, and it's it's a very difficult point to uh, address because you there's already the investment in the bridge, and the bridge is set to a certain elevation, and it goes underneath the train tracks. And essentially what happens if there's a big flood event, uh, that, that area becomes a portal for water to move into the downtown area and flood uh, the, the main street along the downtown, um, along downtown Bridgeport, including the bus terminal and the United Illuminated um, uh, transfer station uh, and, and uh, the sliver by the river, which is the area um, to the right of Amtrak. Um, you see when you look at a, a slosh uh, surge model looking at a category one, two, and three, you can start to understand that really this is area of uh, the, the downtown Bridgeport that with a big storm event, it's essentially a zone of shared risk. Uh, yet the, the, the choices or the investment strategies currently are, um, for example, for the United Illuminated are to build a berm or a wall around that, um, that one area. So there's a big investment going on there. Uh, and there is the potential, or there, there could be the potential of thinking more holistically about this area as a zone and thinking about how to incorporate green infrastructure and adaptation solutions that allow us to um, allow for a better efficiency and more of value from the investment in dealing with the, um, the infrastructure need. Uh, and you can see that when looking at it from an aerial, just to give you better context, here's the floods. Um, this is a sliver by the river, which is actually a, a site that the that Bridgeport has been looking at as a development opportunity. It uh, it's, requires remediation. Here's the Amtrak station, the um, United Illuminated here um, behind, uh, right by the uh, Amtrak, Amtrak, and then the bus terminal. And with flooding, uh, the issue is really that um, you get this kind of uh, flood condition that is really a problem for the entire area, including the road. And so its solution uh, is uh, it's focusing on this as a zone of shared risk, you could start to develop more efficient strategic adaptation solutions for the area. The zones of shared risk concept can, can occur at large scales. And part of the scope of work that we're working on uh, with Circa is to focus on regional scale opportunities for adaptation. So thinking, a watershed is essentially uh, a zone of shared risk. It's an area that when water falls within it, it all uh, drains to a particular area. And in Connecticut, we have issues like combined sewer outfalls, uh, a lot of improvement in areas of, of watershed areas. And so managing at the watersheds is already a practice that exists in the state and something that we need to be thinking about from a resiliency perspective. So taking a watershed area in New Haven and thinking about the complex land uses and the uh, overlay of, of uh, commercial and housing development with, uh, with ecolog rich ecological communities and large uh, wetland complexes <clears throat> raises the need to be strategic and integrate multiple disciplines <clears throat> and recognize the complexity and the kind of wicked problem nature of these, of these um, systems and the, and, the, and the need to think about the stakeholders and who can we tar who should we be targeting where are the decision points or the or the groups of decision makers that impact or that have um a say on how to adapt to these areas or how to influence these areas and how do we target those groups <clears throat> when you get into areas such as uh working along a watershed um you can start identifying patches of communities patches of groups that that share maybe uh, risk and share potentially opportunities. So this idea of identifying and zooming into particular patches, it may or may fall within a neighborhood or it may or may fall within a municipality. Uh, the point is that rec that you start to recognize that you know the political boundaries don't always align with the areas of flooding 
and the potentially valuable decision making groups that could actually move forward with a strategic and efficient plan. So the zones of shared risk really thinks about people and stakeholders and starts to recognize how can we establish a planning process that's effective and that brings in the, the right group of stakeholders that can um, that, that recognize their risks. Uh, and, and then it, the zones of shared work risks works at across scales. And so it's a tool that allows us to think about things regionally, to think about things essentially at a neighborhood scale, but that breaks down from the neighborhood into more of a, a spatial framework that has um, implications for planning. And it can get more nuanced into specific social uh, 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 structures and social um, patches. And then recognizing the process, so understanding the specific issues, thinking about the agency and communication, identifying the places and the people associated or implicated in those places, then developing targeted planning processes for specific zones of shared risk and uh, identifying the stakeholders and going through a process of engagement and education that essentially sets the stage for smart communication, smart design and planning, smart financial strategies and smart implementation strategies is essentially our goal. Uh, the concept came out of uh, working with uh, Guilford on their coastal resilience plan. And you can see in this image, the red areas are repetitive flood loss homes. These repetitive flood loss homes are kind of the canary in the coal mine. These are areas that, you know, you, you, these are homeowners who are complaining about flood risk and who, <clears throat> who are pushing for investment in their property. But when you look at the other zones of shared risk, for example, the SH here is Sachem's Head, there's a pinch point where there's flooding uh, adjacent to Long Marsh that impacts so, you know, over 130 homes. And this has implications for uh, neighborhood value for um, current homeowners, as far as uh, nuisance flooding, as well as future home buyers. Uh, and so addressing these, um, or being able to prioritize and evaluate distinct areas and zones of shared risk and start to, starting to think about how to prioritize um, investment strategies is a key value of the zones of shared risk model. Uh, the, the, the recognizing again that, that there is data and information on, uh, on storm surge impacts on assets. This is an overlay and, and, um, and a component of, the, of defining zones of shared risks. So understanding the risks, but then working as a group based on those zones to start to document and identify areas of work opportunity is the next step. Um, I'm actually going to wrap up here so I can leave time for Peter to move forward on uh, the specific examples and work that he's doing with the landscape architecture program at UConn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Felson. I'm just switching the presenter privileges over to Professor Minuti. Looks great. Okay, we're ready to go? Yep. All right. Well, hello and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, call, uh, calling in from UConn. Uh, we just found out we're going to be closing down after next week uh, for two weeks. And after that, we'll decide on whether or not we will continue to teach online for the rest of the semester. I've been teaching here for 25 years, and this is a very unique situation. This research will continue. Uh, my talk has three parts to it, or actually two major parts. The first is UConn's program of landscape architecture. Who are we and what do we do? Secondly, the maps that we're producing to empower lay people and professionals to make informed decisions. And then at the end, there'll be a group of questions and comments uh, that will include everybody. Setting up my screen here. So uh, the program of landscape architecture has an umbrella component, which is uh, a community research and design collaborative. And this is an umbrella organization of the work done by professors. Generally, it's a group uh, that believes in service learning. 
in sharing our expertise uh, with municipalities and individuals uh, so we can get the theory into practical applications. Uh, this is a view of uh, one of our teams. Uh, we use graduates, undergrads, uh, professors, uh, and definitely multidisciplinary uh, in nature. Next slide. Emily, it's not right now. Oh, there we go. This is um, to give us a, a, a sense of an overview. Uh, if this is the design process uh, from the beginning of a problem or project, uh, is a program development. Then you get into inventory and analysis, and that's uh, what we're doing from UConn. We're doing inventory and analysis of a series of coastal towns in two counties. And right now there's so much information uh, in the public sector that uh, a big role of ours is to simplify the information, categorize the information so it can be useful for other people. We're spending the hours, hundreds of hours to do this uh, to make it more accessible and easy to use. Our work that we're gonna be showing you today, inventory analysis, the mapping, uh, will lead to site selection, which is the next phase. And from site selection, we'll go to planning and design. I think I'm going to change the method of presentation because something is freezing up on me. Sorry about this. Unfortunately, I'll stay in this mode. The images are a little bit smaller, uh, <clears throat> but uh, hopefully it will be consistent going from the image. Um, talking about the methodology, uh, looking at New Haven as the uh, area we're going to focus on this morning. This is generally the threat that we have, uh, that we have sea level rise, which is below the majority of the city. Uh, we have a FEMA flood line of 100 uh, storm that we know will flood parts of the city. And we have uh, a more aggressive uh, projection of the circuit projection of 13 feet. So <clears throat> we know this, this is generally uh, the issue that we have. Water is coming onto the land and how are we going to protect ourselves uh, this from happening. This, uh, I can now move my slides. Uh, this is the location. We're working in two counties, Fairfield County and New Haven County, and three uh, councils of government are in those areas. And we're looking at the coastal towns uh, in these two counties. So we have about 14, 15 towns that we're looking at, and most of the mapping uh, has been completed for these towns. Today, we're going to focus on New Haven uh, to give you a sense of the sort of resources that will be available uh, for all these towns. That will bring us to the maps that we've produced. Six maps in all. Uh, two maps deal with topography and flooding projections. Three maps with town level resource maps. And the final map is shared risks. This is uh, how the maps uh, lay out. So the first set of maps, topography, elevation map, as well as projected flooding. This is FEMA and CERCA data. Secondly, uh, we have town level resource maps, and we've broken those out into ecological systems. 
roads, pervious, impervious, uh, pervious land, excuse me, structures and roadways, which is impervious, characteristics of the land uses, uh, including social uh, vulnerability and things like that. That will terminate on areas of shared risk and This is the first map, uh, and this is the topography map. And as you can see with the larger map to the right, uh, we have read the higher elevations uh, down through the yellows and greens and blues to the lower elevations. So this is giving us the basic structure of the city. Uh, so we can see where the valleys are and the high points. We also have um, a series of support maps, in this case, slope, contours, and watersheds that you really can't uh, read at this level. But one thing we, that we decided is we can't put too much information on each map. So we have the core map, this one topography, elevation, and we have a series of support maps. So if somebody wants to go in and drill down and find out more information about a site, uh, we have the maps ready to go to do that. Now going to uh, just kind of zoom in on this map. This is the typical structure we have uh, for our uh, layout. So we have the map title at the top. We have base context in information. So for all the towns, uh, we also have mapped a thousand feet around the town, all the adjacent towns. These maps can be stitched together so we can review uh, the areas of shared risk across political boundaries. So we've kind of focused town by town. That's the easiest way to get the information, collect the information. In fact, probably the strength of this methodology really to look along um, boundaries and see the shared risks in that way. Uh, the support maps down below on this one is the degree of slope, a slope analysis. Base contours, watersheds. All the maps will have a detailed legend. So the intent is for all the coastal towns and the two um, counties we're talking about, the maps will be available to the public. This is a, an enlargement uh, of the elevation map for New Haven. And what we've done here is we've taken the areas that are flooding in uh, purple for those areas will kind of separate it from the safe water, the water is where it belongs in bays and rivers and streams and wetlands. Uh, but this is water that is not welcome uh, to our communities. So we have uh, in the purple color for that. Uh, we can zoom in to uh, site specific applications and we can zoom out for regional things as well. So those are the first two maps. Uh, to do with elevation, topography, and projected flooding. Actually, actually uh, topography, and go into the projected flooding. Uh, and so this is a, a similar map, but we're focused on lands that are going to be flooding. And we can have a series of uh, stats to support uh, the information. So just for an example, I put up here the watersheds. We have watersheds that will be impacted sub-watersheds most impacted is the structure. Uh, Haven is roughly 1,670 buildings that will be underwater uh, based on either the circa or the FEMA projections. It's about 116 acres of roadway impacted by flooding. Vulnerability and opportunities, uh, about 700 acres of socially vulnerable people will be affected. 1,170 acres Zones. So these are examples of the sort of uh, information, uh, quantitative information that we can cull from, from the data. Zoom in on this and it shows an area adjacent to New, ha uh, New Haven Harbor. It shows a little more information in that we have color coded the buildings that will be inundated. Uh, so the Yellow buildings will be inundated based on the FEMA information. Orange buildings uh, will be circa. Uh, so again, we can just really zoom in to site specific situations, uh, and then we can also come out uh, from that. So 
right, the, this will move us to uh, the next three maps, uh, which are the ecological systems, structures and roadways, and land uses and, and social characteristics. This is an enlargement of a uh, systems map. And uh, based on the legend, you can see the sort of information that we have. So we're, we're collecting information from public sources. We're laying that information on these maps. And the intent here is if somebody um, in a public meeting wants some information about ecological systems, about uh, previous areas, uh, the information's here. And we have support maps to go along with these major maps. And we also continue to show areas that are flooded. So have the, the overlay of ecological systems uh, to what's going to be flooded. Second map in the sequence of the structure and the roadways, as we can see uh, off to the right. Um, and with that, we have key buildings highlighted. Uh, we have storage areas and projects. New Haven has uh, already implemented many projects for sea, sea level rise. We have listed those as well as proposed projects. is an example uh, the, uh, <clears throat> below above this uh, this map. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to have this issue of a sea level rise mitigation part of a larger conversation about good urban planning or suburban planning. It's not separated from that. Just look at the overall patterns of development decisions on those. I really enjoy putting these maps together. It's been uh, about a year and a half process, a lot of meetings. Um, we're just trying to find out what's the easiest, successful way to categorize and to combine this information. Third map uh, in this sequence is the um, characteristics of land uses. So with some ways we're saying ecological systems, that's natural land uses, natural land use of the land. Structures and roadways are cultural use of the land, stuff humans put on the land itself. Third one is characteristics of those two. Blow up of here shows a series of zones or overlays. This is very tightly tied to zoning uh, where we management zone, historic zones, opportunity zones, and, uh, various social vulnerability based on what criteria that we were trying to squeeze out of the information. And that brings us <clears throat> to the final map, which is the areas of shared risk. See off to the right, this is the overall city. Uh, we have a sub-map uh, on the neighborhoods in the lower left-hand corner. People understand their environment, their town by their neighborhood. So this is not, uh, shared risk is not dictated by neighborhood. Uh, often there's a strong correlation shared risk in the This is an enlargement of the areas of shared risk, uh, major uh, river corridors in New Haven. Uh, we have a fairly complex methodology on how we create these circles, how we create these zones uh, that can be shared. Uh, I would say it's about 75 to 80% complete. Uh, it's based on GIS and ArcView, having similar characteristics and then grouping uh, these neighborhoods uh, based on those characteristics. Then that wraps up uh, this part of the presentation. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to Joanna. We'll have some questions for the audience. Thank you for your time.
Thank you very much, Professor Minuti. I'm uh, just unmuting our presenters and I will be sharing um, my PowerPoint there. So I just wanted to uh, open it up to some questions if anybody, if anybody had any along the way. Um, one thing I did want to ask uh, Professor Minuti was, how can uh, planning entities use these maps to communicate risk to their residents? Is that te technically using the maps? Yeah, uh, uh, technically and um, and planning. Yeah, so um, uh, over the years, I've done a lot of uh, public workshops and um, the idea of uh, having, having these meetings, sitting around a table, We'll bring up some issue, uh, whatever they're most interested in, and bring up a map, and we can talk about specifics versus kind of ethical or philosophical issues. So I found over the years that when we talk about people talk about the kind of their their value system, it's always interesting to hear. Very difficult to progress forward and come up with decisions based on value system. We can look at the actual geometric entities uh, for these different characteristics. So I find it really uh, promotes the dialogue, this trust, uh, cherry picking information, comprehensive information. So there seems to be a real trust and believe it or not, it becomes a very uh, stimulating and fun experience uh, of work. That's great, thank you. Uh, Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Alex. This is Alex. Um, you know, there's the, the, the uh, zones like the historic district, uh, and you can see the white areas, the in-between areas from those, and then you can, the overlay of the opportunity zones uh, over areas that are uh, likely to go through um, adaptation uh, decisions, as well as the um, looking at the ongoing project that the city has, being able to overlay all of that information onto you know, where should, what, where's my house located to all this, or uh, what do you think the city should prioritize first, you know, and understanding it in the context of the, of the decision making at the city scale is really a critical value of these maps. Great, thank you. We have um, a question from the audience. They're asking, when is the timeline for the current mapping initiative to go live for our access? So, um, Dr. Onad, if you want to talk about the vulnerability assessment first. I'm not sure she can hear. All right, Dr. Uh, Professor Minuti, if you want to address okay. the... Oh, you can, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay. No. Great. Um, so um, the Coastal Vulnerability Viewer is going to be available mid-April to late, late April. Uh, we are aiming for the mid-April. And you'll be able to download the layers or just play with the viewer, um, take, uh, um, you know, picture files and everything. And um, the report about the Coastal Vulnerability Weaver and the Coastal Vulnerability Assessment is going to be available early uh, summer, so we are aiming for June. Um, and we are hoping for the zones of shared risk uh, between May to June to be available. Great. And Professor Minuti, do you want to follow up with the, um, the timeline for zones of shared risk and for the rest of the, um, the project area? Uh, so, um, I'll defer it to Circa as far as when it will be publicly released. Our work will be substantially complete over the next week or two. So, we're, we're at that point to hand this information over to Circa, and they'll be the ones, the entity, releasing the information. Great, thank you. Um, Professor Felson, I wanted to ask you if um, what are some of the key types of regional assets that you've seen emerge through the zones of shared risk methodology? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, let's see, there's drinking water. Uh, that was one of the issues that I think was interesting. Regional water supplies, they function on a north-south basis and there's challenges uh, if you have a patch or an area or town that has, you know, especially during the last drought. Uh, that didn't have water, you have to exchange, or, you know, there was, uh, there were pipes that moved water across the Merritt Parkway to, uh, uh, examples like that. Um, that's one, I think the, uh, 
um, I mean, starting with transportation routes as well as looking at uh, um, waterway systems, rivers, and their riparian buffers, and thinking about how the systems function from a watershed perspective. I think it's important. Um, looking at the uh, public transportation systems and how those overlay on uh, regional scale systems. Um, definitely looking at um, uh, also at the uh, parallel, you know, the highway systems, 95 and the Merritt and um, others and looking at the relationship that those have from a emergency management perspective. So, um, yeah, I think we're trying to expand it to look also at evacuation routes and egress, egress routes and how those um, function in a north south fashion. Both formal and informal evacuation routes, too. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, Dr. Onat, what are some of the challenges you've seen with putting together these different sources of GIS data? And how have you managed uh, integrating them together? Um, so there's some limitations of the study, and um, that's the occurring the any kind of. Uh, so we use mostly the data from available from um, Department of Environmental Protection or NOAA or some of the files that we'd be able to do that. Um, there is difficulties in acquiring any kind of observational data, so that is not really um, available. And there are also the complexities in um, any kind of a structural damage uh, that's available already there. Uh, because we just assume that everything is functioning normally. Um, so any kind of a varying spatial or temporal scales is also a challenge to us to integrate because not every data is homogeneous. So we had to um, integrate that in our analysis. So um, those are one of the physical, like the, any kind of a implication of a risk or like potential loss of the all dependent variables. Um, on physical characteristics are the, one of the challenges that we had to incorporate. Could could you also expand a little bit on the model that's used to understand what vulnerability means? Um, I'm, I'm particularly thinking about exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity. Um, sure. The exposure is like we are if you just think about the exposure, it's mostly like how it is affecting, like how the physical aspects or the climate aspects is affecting your uh, place and how it is reacting with the hazard. Without the normal uh, likelihood of um, something can happen to that. So an, an example to the exposure can be um, the elevation because it's a physical pro property or like sea level rise, it's going to be there no matter what like you do. Uh, but sensitivity can be for social or economic or built environment. Uh, because like if you have a vulnerable population there, or if you have a um, critical habitat there, or uh, if you have a critical infrastructure there, there's a likelihood of events can impact more than a normal place. Um, like normal place, meaning that they are less sensitive to that. So we are thinking about the vulnerability in terms of exposure and sensitivity and their ability to cope is we call it adaptive capacity um, because that place that you're looking for or the system that you're looking for is naturally be able to cope to negative impacts. Like maybe they have a um, marsh system can mitigate or maybe they have a coastal forest or maybe they have a coastal structure or living shoreline that can fight with, fight with the impacts or they have um, higher flood insurance rates or like uh, municipal resilience funds. So those are all the uh, aspects that can reduce the impact uh, that, that you can have it in adaptive capacity. So the vulnerability that when we consider is that it's in terms of all these three aspects is like the exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity. That's wonderful too. Um, I, that's where some of these connections are coming with the zones of shared risk and then uh, developing a vulnerability model with the exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity is putting in all of these the existing conditions, the things that complicate the conditions, and then some of the things that we could do to address the uh, climate vulnerabilities that we have. So trying to put all the pieces together so that plans can, um, municipalities and regions can put them into their plans and, and understand, we have a problem, where do we go from here? Yeah. Yes. 
exactly. So we've reached the, the top of the hour. So I just wanted to say a, a big thanks to our presenters and we really appreciate with everything else that's going on um, around us. And we really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us. Just wanna let you know that the uh, webinar uh, materials will be added to the Resilient Connecticut website. And we also have a brand new YouTube channel. So we invite you to subscribe so you'll know when new videos go up. And uh, the more subscribers we get, we can go live with our, our events um, uh, later this year. So that would be great. And thank you very much, and feel free to email us if you have any other further questions. Great. Thank